time is 5.30, we'll call the meeting of order. This is Northampton Historical Commission, uh, Monday, April 29th, 2019. The meeting is called order. The first item on our agenda is that the meeting may be video or audio recorded. Um, the next item is to invite general public comment, generally for any topic not already uh, on the, the agenda for the evening, um, which you're welcome to review. But is there any general public comment? Being none, we'll, uh, we'll move forward um, to uh, uh, approval of minutes. There were not. There were no minutes to review. So we'll table that um, and review at our next meeting. Um, the next item on the agenda is review proposed exterior lighting pursuant to historic preservation restriction 1924 uh, LLC. 49 Brown Hill Road, map ID 31B-004. Um, and uh, we had a long discussion on this topic uh, at our last meeting, but uh, we, we uh, will reopen that discussion. Hi, go on. Just getting in the way. It is not. So the, the background on this is that the, the city solicitor weighed in that even if the entirety of a project, um, except for exempt elements, is subject to um, local historic district review, the commission can't regulate those items um, without the consent of the applicant. So anything that's specifically listed as an exempt project category does not need to historic district review. But because the commission holds a preservation restriction on this property, it, it still needs review under that process. Could you please say that in this direction, please? Uh, I mean, you could put the table if you like it. I, I don't know if I anyone else is coming. And I, I do have a comment about, because I listened to the last meeting, which was recorded. Um, it's, it's kind of difficult to follow the meeting when it's recorded. And I'm not suggesting that we be facing the camera, but it doesn't pick up sound that well. Yeah, and it's not really set up for recording. This was sort of yeah, a, yeah. an afterthought. So um, really it's just something to think about if, say, somebody who can't be a meeting needs to listen to it. it it's not great. You're not getting a really good sense of the meeting all the time because you can't understand everything. And obviously you can't see what anybody's seeing. Mm -hmm. And you can't see the presentation. So you just... So I, I provided a summary of my staff report, which I also provided to you that, that this is a, this work is exempt from local historic district permitting, but still requires review under a permanent preservation restriction. If I could, you know, let me just review some of the facts of this, and then I, this will be a, then procedurally we'll have um, discussion amongst the members of the board, and then invite. Comment and question. I keep it as um, But um, we have received um, a copy of the preservation restriction agreement between the city of Northampton um, and the Historic Round Hill Summit LLC, um, uh, and, uh, which is relevant to the current um, owners. It's, a, uh, it's an agreement that is generically produced whenever uh, um, all, the, all um, it, properties enter into a historic district. But why? This was, this was because it was for tax no. purposes? Okay, no. I'm sorry. The uh, so a historic preservation re restriction was required in this instance because under zoning um, there is some flexibility provided if there's a reuse of a religious or educational building, but the caveat with that is that the owner has to enter into a permanent restriction agreement with the city. So we um, ended up as the recipients, the grantees of the um, restriction agreement, um, which laid out certain things that the grantor uh, in perpetuity uh, can and can't do. Um, and it also leaves room for, for decision making and uh, uh, discussion. Um, 
that was sent out to you. I hope you've had a chance at least to review it. Um, and if you have not, then I'd be happy to go further. But if you have, let me know. I won't go into into detail. Okay. What is the date of that? Four fifteen, two thousand sixteen.
with its facade, uh, and you might take it into account, I think, also the neighborhood role, um, or not. And there's, there's latitude within the, the uh, interior standards for you to take different positions, I think. Uh, but whether it's under our jurisdictional um, um, role, uh, supervision, I think it's clear that, clearly stated that it is, but given that it is, we still have the um, decision to make about its appropriateness, and I'll stand back at that point and let the committee make its determination. They still are on the building. You know, right. They're still there. Um, I, I think it's a difficult decision as well. I'm, but I do think, it, I mean, to me, it does seem to come under that major changes in the exterior that's listed in the preservation restriction. I don't think I should have any comment on this because I've been out so long, so many meetings on this topic. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like I'm really up to speed on it. Uh, I do have a couple of questions. The lights don't shine up, they only shine down. Right? right. Why did they circumvent the process here? I mean, that was a big project coming forward, and they were so proud of it. And then this gets added in. I mean, it reminds me of the situation with the HVAC at 264 Elm Street, where that was, that was a major expense for that property owner. I don't think this is gonna be a big expense to do something better. I think it's more, is it right or is it wrong? Was the process followed and was it not? So. I you so You can comment. Oh, I guess my own comment is I'm not sure what is better. I'm running out of what it, a less intrusive lighting option would be. Um, there's not that many options. Something that I think, to me, it was something not on the building. Which would be, which was actually more historically accurate than a non-building method. 
So the purpose of this, this lighting array is to light up a sidewalk to get to the entrance Pathways. door? Yeah. Okay. And the alternative they had said would be the, the baller lighting, you know, along the pathway, um, which they said, I guess, I got the impression, or I think they said, that it would be, you know, that would be significantly more expensive, but I didn't think that what it costs is, you know, concerns us. You know, the cost shouldn't concern us. It's, you know, how historically accurate mm -hmm. um, will it be. So, um, you know, and the other thing that was uh, pointed out was that putting the bollards along the walkway, um, you know, it's not a particularly distinctive or, you know, attractive walkway. So you're kind of bringing attention to a feature that shouldn't be, you know, accentuated, accentuated. Um, and so that was also, you know, in the, in the weighing of uh, consideration. Um, so I, I actually did look at the Secretary's standards, um, <clears throat> their full manual, there's a specific section that's dedicated to rehabilitation, which this project is. And <clears throat> just to see where they weigh in on it, uh, they don't have a specific section on lighting per se, but they do <clears throat> have a section that deals with alterations and additions for new use, which this is. Um, So what they say about um, lighting in this is that what would be recommended is designing new on-site features, um, including lighting, when required by a new use, which this is because it's being adapted for a different function, um, so that they're as unobtrusive as possible, retain the historic relationship between the building or buildings and the landscape, and are compatible with the historic character of the property. Um, so I um, think I've, you know, I've been clear at the last meetings, I, I don't have an aesthetic issue with this. I think that they're actually enhancement to that building. Um, and one, one of the things that, um, the alternative would be putting more lights into the landscape, which to me is just not in, in keeping with what is recommended here. Um, cluttering up the landscape with a lot of little lighting all over the place, I think would be really a big mistake. It would not be historically compatible. Um, I did go take a look at the building up in Greenfield that Tom would give us, give the, us an example of. It was up there one night or something else. And um, the, you know, the lighting is, um, it's really, I would not consider this to be wall washing lighting. Um, wall washing is usually with much more, um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, this is a lighting company that I've used before, Ken Lighting, it's, they make uh, in-ground fixtures that you can um, have modified to wash up a building. And it's a much different effect. I mean, I think these lights are more spots and they're, um, at least the building in Greenville, they're very, very, it has a very minimal um, impact, I think, on the whole building. And especially if you contrast it with the street lights that are up there, which are just, you know, glaring. So, that's why right. My interpretation of the secretary's standards, also what are in the historic district guidelines, which are, yes, we do say about avoiding wall washing, but I don't, I don't think this is wall washing. Do you have any other questions? Janet, Nick, do you have a comment on this? Yes. Um, as I recall, what Tom Douglas said was not no bollards, but no coal lights. And I really don't know where that came from, since there are seven new pole lights in the parking area. And um, actually, there were pole lights on the campus. There was a pole light at one time in front of Hubbard, <coughs> and also this one that I never saw before, but um, 
I found an old picture. There was a pole light um, in along the um, curb in front of Gateway. And, um, you know, clearly they can do whatever they want. That it's, it's not visible from a public way. And a lot of those buildings are not visible from a public way. Um, <clears throat> I think, um, you know, that appropriate pole lights, you can even get some that have, um, you know, solar panels so they won't have to pay for electricity would be a lot better. And um, certainly the standard says lighting of the landscape or wash lighting of buildings or trees is not permitted, which is a fairly strong statement. And I don't know when this business with the um, restriction, you gave the date of 2016. I don't know why there wasn't an earlier one when the property was first purchased. Could have, could have been, I'm not sure. Is yep. that when this was registered? Sarah, can you answer that? That it was, it's not a requirement upon purchase, it's a requirement upon receipt of a plan for a permit. Right. And then however long it takes well, to put the, the restriction together. Yeah, well I wondered why 2016. That's, that's a, the date on this yes. barcode, I don't know. But it wasn't it, earlier. It, it may be an earlier date. Right. Um, I don't believe they actually started doing any work before 2015. That could be true. At least not they, on the exterior. Yeah, and they did, they did own it. Previously. Yes, yes. Um, but, you know, I do find those streaming lights to be obtrusive. And certainly they are going to stream on the landscape um, as they make their way to the walkway. Um, they can, as I said, they can do what they want. Um, the, um, the other buildings that are not visible from the public way, I think it would be more historically appropriate to do it, to have pole lights in the front. I don't think there are going to be busloads of people coming up Round Hill Road to look at the buildings at night. <clears throat> I mean, what went on in those buildings was horrific, and um, you know, people just aren't going to come to see them. So you're speaking against the lights on the building. Right. You're speaking against it, even though um, the North of York, they would be motion activated and not. Well, they'll be on until 9 o'clock. They would be on, okay. Can I, can I ask a question? Um, I'm going to invite Tom. Tom, would you like to speak? I, I only have one point I'm confused about. This is not supposed to be a public hearing, but that was the terms of the preservation restriction. This is a regular, regularly scheduled meeting that was on our agenda. I, I don't see it as a hearing. We're, we always take comments from people who are in the meeting. But, and, and, and just as we welcome yours. Well, um, if you read the preservation restriction, it, it, it does not involve a public hearing. There's, there's nothing about public comment that is even suggested in the preservation restriction. Otherwise, I would have been here a half hour ago. So I, it was my understanding, reading that restriction carefully, that there was absolutely no public comment, that this decision from the board could be made in a back room somewhere. So it just so happens that you will make it a decision in within a public hearing, but it doesn't say anything about public comment. It, this isn't a public, it's hearing. Our public hearing. It's our public meeting. It, no decision of the commission can be made behind closed doors. But the preservation restriction doesn't say that it has to be a public meeting or any public comment is is welcomed. That's. I'm just. Com I'm not trying to say what you're doing is wrong. I'm just very confused about the language of that preservation restriction because it clearly states that it's not a public hearing, and this is a public hearing, um, whether it seems it's advertised or not, but it, it is. Well, it's I'm, a public meeting. You take I've, public been, I've been um, with the Charleston Commission for many years, and I've um, never seen any meeting where the public was not invited 
to make comment, just as you are invited to make comment. Um, and it's by way of transparency and public participation. It's not, I don't regard it as a hearing, as a public hearing either. Um, but we do and always have welcomed the, uh, the, the public's comments. I, and just as we welcome yours. I understand that in the regular setting of a commission hearing or something, yeah. the, the historic commission hearing, but the preservation restriction is not at all under the commission's, like, uh, I don't know how to say it, but it's outside of the commission's ordinance. It's, it's, it falls within in its own category, and you review it based on the National Trust standards, and it's not, it clearly says in the preservation restriction, it's not a public hearing or public meeting. So, I mean, otherwise I will, it might not have even come if I had not just been curious. But. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure how I would define the difference uh, between a, a meeting and a hearing, um, um, given that, that our standard operating procedure has always been to listen to the public um, in every meeting on any, on any topic here, you know, most of which do not include hearings. Right. Um, okay. So, um, was uh, Mr. I, I, misunderstanding. I, no, you're welcome. You're welcome to present anything any, and everything you like. Okay. But if the if the point is that our our decision making should be based on the the um, the guidelines in front of us, I think I completely agree. Right. It's just the re preservation restriction is very different than what you typically hear. You, what, you, you probably don't have very many preservation restriction agreements that you rule on, I'm guessing. So this is a very unique thing. Well, with, what we reviewed before you came was that the preservation, preservation restriction uh, takes pains to identify in some detail what's a minor, what's a major um, uh, category of work. And um, uh, the changes that seem relevant uh, included, as described as major, included installation of architectural detail, which does not have a historical basis, and possibly some of the um, conditions under electrical, uh, which have to do with uh, uh, exterior um, appurtenances to the building. Yeah, I know. Um, I understand. And that was, I, I framed that discussion to mean that the, that indicated that those are areas that, that the commission um, is required to look at uh, because of its category as major, but that the decision as to how to decide on those is not predisposed. It's not pre preordained just because it's major. Um, we can look at it as major and then be guided by the secretary's uh, guidelines and make our own determination on that. Yes, I, I totally agree. Is that fair to say? Right. It just doesn't involve a public comment session. Yeah, you. That, that well, is well, exactly what you're supposed I'm, to do. We have a philosophy that I just I've always welcomed public comment. Um, but it specifically states it's not a public hearing. So you put people at an unfair advantage, or disadvantage, put people at disadvantage by saying it's not a public hearing, therefore there's no public comment, but then you have public comment. So It's on our agenda and, and was, was, properly, was properly posted as, as an agenda item uh, for today. Um, and as an agenda item, if somebody who lives in North and wants to comment on that, I'd be hard put to say no to their comment. Um, it, it's, it's all properly posted. It, I, I don't see it as a hearing. I think your point's correct. Okay. Uh, but having said that, um, most of Northampton welcomes, and its committees welcome comments from its citizens. Okay. And for good reason, um, I and, understand. And, and I'd like to continue that tradition. Okay. So, I'm sorry. 
So uh, having said all that and recognizing that this is a, a meeting about uh, the preservation restriction and not a hearing, a public hearing per se, uh, I continue to welcome your, your comments or uh, additions to the discussion. Come sit at the table. I just want to, this is going to go out my edit me. Um, I just want clarification to somebody to remind me, in the, and maybe that Tom would have the answer to this, that in the parking lot for this building, what is the lighting there? There are pole lights. Right. And are they motion sensors? Do they um, or are they just on to a certain time? Or? The agreement was that all would go off at 9 o'clock, except for three could stay on. Okay. So the planning board um, allowed that because the neighbors preferred that over motion sense. Right, right. Okay. So there will be some light in. Right. Right. Yeah. Which makes sense. Right. Okay. So I'm sorry, if you wanted to say something. No, I, 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 okay. I've said enough for the last two hearings. I'm sure you don't want to hear me say anything else. Well, this is the committee's pleasure for this What? Can I say one other thing? Just that first hearing, sure. Martha's review of this, which I, it, I was negligent and not really looking at the standards there, mm -hmm. that I feel that I'm, I've certainly seen other historic buildings that have had this sort of lighting, and I feel like buildings can't just stay, they, they have to change and adapt, and you, as you were saying, it's, it's a new use of, for the building. Um, I think in spite of the fact, I mean, this is not my preference. I don't know what would be. It seems like nothing's really an ideal way to either light a path, light a, um, a, a sidewalk or, or um, something to get from the building to the parking lot at night. But I do feel, I agree with Martha, that a lot of pole lights or just other lighting on walkways would be just very cluttered and not necessarily a really good thing. And I think because these lights in the build on the building would would not be on all the time. And they're designed to light the walkways and not a wash on the building. I think that they would be my preference to do that. And as I said, I'm still I don't I'm, you know, I'm not flogging you again, Tom, but I just I'm not happy with the process by what how this happened the order in which things happened and that things happened before we were able to um, reflect on this. But that's my um, current thinking about this. Okay. Would someone like to make a motion on that? <clears throat> what type of a motion would you like? Well, we need, uh, we need to make a response to the applicant. Um, within a time period or where it is granted um, um, by right. Uh, so if there's any question um, uh, about this, if anyone has any further uh, questions that they have, we need to bring them now, we need to make a decision. Otherwise, we're essentially uh, not making a decision, which is in itself a decision. Uh, can you hold on? Yeah. And I think we're at a better okay. word. Okay. The question we need to I just want to ask one, one more question. All of the lights will go will be triggered on if regardless of where the pedestrian is. No, um, each facade of the building has motion sensors that are dedicated to that facade. Okay. So if someone's walking in front, it's only should be only the front lights that are going right. on That's and not the back or the that's, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I feel pretty strong that we need to bring some closure to this because we've been um, mulling over this for a long time and it's um, just we need to put some closure on it. And <clears throat> I think that people have aired their concerns pretty clearly. Um, we had issues with the process and I think that our concerns about that have been well uh, transmitted to those involved in this pro the process pro 
um, failure will probably not happen again. I don't know about mass historical, but that's a whole other situation. Um, so I, I mean, I'm happy to make a, a motion um, so that we can move this along if that's what people would like. Okay. So uh, I will go um, make a motion that we um, approve the lighting as proposed by the architect um, for Gawith Hall. Um, Is there any more than that? And is your second? Second. Okay, any discussion? Okay. Uh, I'll call the vote, although we'll have to probably see a show of hands uh, because uh, we want to be accurate. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, please uh, signify by raising your hand. Okay. All, right. all those. I'm raising my hand. Okay, so that's three. Okay. okay. Um, all those, uh, how many uh, are anybody abstaining? So I get three votes. And the three was abstaining. Okay, that fails. Please? Motion fails. I'm glad it's over. <laughs> and just to be clear, I can't vote, right? Right, you can't okay. vote at all. You're just not no. a choice. Okay. okay. Craig, this is not a this was not a hearing, so you, you can't vote if you like, you're not precluded from voting. I just don't feel like I'm up to speed on it. I've been out so long. Um, my natural inclination is that I would not be in favor of this simply because I'm a stickler for the process to be followed correctly. But I don't want to punish the developer. But I don't feel that I'm up to speed on this issue. I'm mostly up, I'm up to speed on most issues in this, but not this. It's only been a couple of weeks since me getting back to normal, and I'm in peak time of year for my real estate practice, so I, I'm not able to get up to speed quickly on this. I'm sorry. But just so you're clear, we're not voting on the process. No. Okay, just so you know that. That's not I don't feel like I'm knowledgeable enough to know about the design. So what does that mean? It means we're going to talk about it more. Does the project go away if I say, all right? I don't know. I'm just, I just wanted to make that clear so we're not voting on the process. Okay. Well, the, the preservation restriction says you have up to 60 days to decide. But then it says, like, it pretty much gives you an unlimited amount of time to decide, which is funny. It says, if in 60 days you haven't decided, you can notify the, the owner that you, you're still deciding. <laughs> it's very open-ended. It's sort of comical. But, you know. <laughs> And nothing would preclude a modified symbol at any time. Can you give us some guidance on um I mean, I, it's, the, uh, the commission didn't find the proposal to be in conformance with the Secretary of the Interior standards. So at, at this point, I, I don't think there's anything more to discuss. Okay. Uh, in fairness to the applicant, if there are any um, other opportunities for the issue to be raised, please make the applicant aware of them. Um, 
not to have one for long something beyond a uh, reasonable uh, length of time, but I, uh, I also uh, don't want to make the process seem unfair. not a plan that was met with favor, there should be an alternative plan that would, could be met with favor. So I think we need to be more specific about that, though. I think it's... Um, well, that's where my weak spot is, because I'm not up to speed, really, on the project. How long is it going to take you to come up to speed? Because we need to have a forum, a you know, majority of people or at least enough, enough people here to be able to vote and not have half the members abstain. Give me a deadline. <laughs> well, our next I meeting is May 20. But I also think it would be useful because we ran into this issue with the planning board saying something which was what made you initially come up with this plan, right? Because right. You know, that we have to know maybe what planning board would or wouldn't accept. But it might be useful just to have some general comments from the planning board so that we would know if we're going to just be so diametrically opposite that we need to find some common ground with them. Because if we say one thing and then the planning board doesn't approve it, Tom's in the same situation. Right. So. Is that something that we could get some kind of comment? Mm -hmm. I think to help resolve this. The, the surprise in the process was when they they said um, call the poll lights off at nine. Right. Turn on the wall sconces if you want with motion sensors, and I didn't have any wall sconces, so right. so that was a surprise. And then the other the other thing I understand completely, which is the light levels and the amount of light that can, is allowed to spill across the property, right. which is zero. So I have a good grasp on what their requirements are. And, and beyond the, the requirements that Tom is, is familiar with, it's somewhat difficult because they are a permit granting board also, so they can't really opine about a particular design unless it's formally been presented to them, um, but just can refer people to the overall um, zoning board. So can we give him some parameters about how he should proceed? I know we're talking about trying to um, put more pole lights in or, or light the pathway with bollards. Like, what are we talking about? Because I think we have to be very specific about this. I just a question to some of the people who objected. Were, did you object to the actual fixture being more contemporary looking, if it was a more historical, almost like a gaslight sconce? Would that be more acceptable? From my personal perspective, yes. from, uh, uh, the building's facade is unpainted, decoratively laid brick. It uh, is part of it. It was in a um, residential school and is now surrounded. It's now it's a residential environment on all four sides. Um, the building never had sconces. Sconces that were not necessary for the elimination of a walkway. The walkway in question was not actually being used late at night. Um, 
personal safety is certainly a concern, but um, there are many ways to eliminate things. Um, my concern would have also been raised if it had been a pseudo-historical LED picture of shooting downward, washing downward on the side of a, of a building because they, um, those are, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a wall sconce where wall sconces would never have been put. Um, and uh, we're not there in the building. There are plenty of other alternatives for elimination. So it wasn't necessary. It was not the result of any report to the city of accidents or injuries. Um, and um, it, it uh, was not, it was not historical and, and was not in response to a demonstrable or recorded need. Um, so I think any want a sconce fixture would be problematic okay. to me. Um, but I, and certain things were allowable or right, which was uh, uh, bright under under porch lighting, uh, portex and called portico lighting. And um, the building had three wall packs on it already, uh, which seemed to me to uh, allow some lighting uh, there um, already, maybe not the same fixtures, but we're not um, entitled to, to limit pre-existing uh, fixtures on, on a building. Um, so I just, I, you know, it, it, it's, this is not that sort of building that is, the use of this building is not um, the same as something that's near a uh, city center um, as a Greenfield or in some of the buildings on Pleasant Street which effectively use the ball washing fixtures. Uh, I will say too that it was the fixtures, while contemporary and minimal, are nonetheless flat panels of LED lights and, and are, when you fasten them four inches away from a wall pointing downward, they have the, regardless of the tent, they have the inevitable impact of ball washing units. Um, um, frankly, more so than pathway illumination units, but um, it, it, there are a number of things can grow with them to me. But that, I'm just, that's just my single person's opinion. Can I ask a question? Um, I know at the last meeting you said, since we did have three wall packs there, that we were able to retain those. Does that mean we retain a light in those existing locations, or we can? I didn't quite hear you. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, Does that mean we can retain? Do we retain those? I, ha I, ha well, I have to change those fixtures. They're not allowed by zoning, so I have to all change out the fixture to a new downlight of some kind. So um, I, the planning board doesn't care where they go. You do care where they go. So when I change out those three fixtures, can I put them where I want, or do they need to stay where the existing fixtures are currently located? I'm not speaking for the board at all, and so I'll be quick and just speak for myself. They, I think that they should be, but to stay, to stay in honorable distance of the regulations and the in intentions of the regulations, they should be close to where they were originally, but they don't have to be exactly where they were. Um, and I think that's only fair to you as, as the architect that there some allowance be given. Um, and, and also certainly we're not, we can't take away fixtures that were previously there when the applicants came to us. So I think you, by fairness, you have to, we have to give you the right to three. And, and that wouldn't mean sort of around on the other side of the building, although you're not proposing that. I'm just saying for, for the sake of discussion, it, it should be sort of, in my mind, sort of where the old work, but exactly where it should, could be a matter of discussion here. And, and I have one other question, clarification. Mm -hmm. um, in terms, so the ruling that, that well, so your ruling says, does it apply to only the fixtures that are visible from a street, or does it apply to the entire building? That none, none of our, none of our, we're, yeah, we're not entitled to, to make decisions about what's not visible from the street. 
So the it preservation restriction. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, the, the preservation restriction is in a lot of ways a lot more restrictive than the local historic district ordinance. So it covers the the premises and its in its entirety, whether it's visible from a public way or not. Stand okay. One other clarification. So we have preservation restriction on the other buildings up there, Skinner and the boiler house. I was proposing on the boiler house a similar style of light. I haven't submitted it to you yet. But the, they're not visible from a public way, so it's, they're under the guidelines of the preservation restriction. So I'm assuming that the lights that I propose for those, since they're the same as Gaywith, would be uh, looked at negatively, and so I shouldn't even propose them probably. Just one okay. <laughs> and, it, and it's a different building too, so it would certainly be within the commission's discretion to consider each building on its own merits. I and mean, what's right for one building might not be right for another building. Yeah, the boiler house is an industrial building, but still in a residential district. But had a bunch of big wall pack floodlights on around it. You're, you're um, I can just say parenthetically, you, I don't think, were here for some of the presentations we received from the first applicants right. um, for development on the hill. And we received clear, heartfelt, and strong commitment from the applicants that every single T would be crossed and I would be dotted in following all of the, uh, not just the requirements and ordinances, but the, the, the guidance of the historic district. Um, uh, there was such clear intent and commitment expressed when we proceeded with this project that it uh, that that needs to be understood in, in understanding how we have responded to the changes that have been proposed here. It's uh, uh, that's at least from my perspective. I am, I understand that, but there are quite a few things that fall into gray areas where I would I just wouldn't Indeed. know whether you know, Indeed. 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 Um, I just want to follow up. I think that I, I'm not sure that I'm clear about what we're asking Tom to do. So we still need to do that. And um, just along that line, I think that um, if we're starting to think about, if we're recommending, um, not that I agree with this, but we're recommending that you know we look at putting in, again, as I said, more stuff into the landscape. I mean, I think we need to look at that really critically about the impact on the historic site. Mm -hmm. It's not just a building, it's a campus. And um, there is a lot of, you know, a lot of integrity that needs to be maintained there. That's a landscape that has a lot of significance. So. I agree. So, just, you know, so how does <coughs> so that so it seems like if the options are pole lights or bollards, which you know, which is a preferable. Which would be preferable to, um, you know, maintaining, you know, the beauty of, of the, you know, Round Hill campus there. You know, what would be a better, what would be least obtrusive yeah. to the beauty of the landscape there? And I don't know. It seems like, you know, pole lights just seem to be more visible. Uh, so I just don't know if. You know, pole lights are a good, would be a good solution. I think I, for one, am going to go up there more, more times at night and really teach about it see, some more. Yeah. You know, see that at night, but I want to mm -hmm. do it again and just reflect on it. So are we asking Tom to um, come back with a proposal for lighting this, try to achieve the same objectives of lighting this 
circulation system, essentially, mm -hmm. with pole lights mm -hmm. versus bollards mm -hmm. versus the fixtures that are going on in the building? Is that or, what we're asking him to do? Or a combination of pole lights and bollards. So um, you, know, you, don't like, you don't feel like you're walking through um, you know, the jungle of uh, lamp posts. I don't know. Is that Well, I guess that's what we're asking. That's what we're asking. <laughs> <laughs> the the alternative proposal. The, the, uh, the uh, wall sconces are out, and so the only other alternatives are whole whites and bollards. Right. So whatever um, you know, combination or one or the other that um, will work is what we're going to be voting on next. Okay. I, I can't think of anything else. unless there's another option out there that I. Um, If you'd be okay with that, take a question from Janet. Oh, okay. yeah. You know, I wonder because the Smith campus uses so many pole lights, um, if that isn't something that you uh, should take a look at. Um, because <clears throat> that seems to be effective lighting. You say you like the lighting. Then. Well, I don't know. I mean, I would have to look at it critically, which I've not done. But certainly, they do use pole lights. Okay. If pole lights are right. if pole lights are approved, yeah, it's we, we accept that comment. We can't obviously I, no I one can guarantee that no, anyone would use them. But now, yeah. uh, thank you. It does. Smith does illuminate the campus. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And they use like I think it's a reproduction. Having walked through it at night, it's like a you know a reproduction that kind of looks like an acorn-shaped lantern hanging from a curved pole. Yeah, those are the ones we used in the parking lot. Right. Okay. So when I first presented to the planning board, I said we're going to just use the same one that Smith uses because oh, okay. they are really nice. They are nice. Yeah.
So at the last commission meeting, the um, the agreement was to allow demolition of 43 Finn Street pursuant to the changes discussed at that meeting. So I just wanted to present the, um, the final architect's plan and just make sure that it, it seems to match up with what the commission okay. And we had, agree to we had a public hearing on that. Said that's just, yes, is there revised for right. And what is, the, what is the material on the exterior of that building? Yeah, um, and it's my understanding, but it's from, clobbered, but I'm, I again, listening sure. to that meeting, please. That, listening to, when I listened to the meeting, the impression I got was that the commission had asked for the possibility of breaking up this roof line. Yes. And, and so I don't see that happening. That would be a hardship for the applicant. Which is a shame. Okay. Because this seems like no are we are no. we discussing this? Because to me, this so they, doesn't they, look like a residential. No, it's not a residential. No one's so we, getting, yeah, we, we, no one's getting what they want yeah. out of this. Well, they, I think the applicant does. Yeah, yeah. Well, they wanted to. Apparently, she wanted to design something different. She would have lived in a home that was at uh, the Indian. Well, well, was more, she said, yeah, more. Um, right, but she said she said, but she said we thought you wanted this, yeah. and we, right. we thought what what. Who, and I thought that was kind of a shame. That seemed like a not a because yeah, this is not place. really what. Yeah. You know, not really what we want. No. And if you know, no one's getting what they want. I feel like, well, they should have just done what they wanted. Yeah. Well, that, that's always. I mean, it, it's always within the, the capability of an applicant to file for a demo and wait a year and literally build exactly what they want. Yeah. Uh, we, we were attempting to um, move them along to speed the process along. Right. Yeah. There was a lot of pressure. Yeah. Is this vinyl on the outside or hardy plane? Yeah, I don't. We don't. I don't know. Um, the commission didn't require that. Um, is that so why you, we don't know? Well, you didn't. You didn't. Yeah, you didn't. Yes. No. no. So the the alternate plan has already been approved. This is just sort of the final yeah. check. Like, is, I just is, I remind is ourselves that we have yeah. literally zero control over this yeah. after one year of yeah. demo delay, yeah. and so we really can't look at it as if it were in the district. Uh, the applicants could have put up anything that would have passed zoning and building code uh, after one year. Why did it get the demo delay? I didn't think it was historic. Well, it actually turned out to be, and, and um, uh, yeah, we, we found there were some excellent photographs of it back in the day. It was the home of the manager of the Academy of Music for 30 years, uh, and uh, it was a quite a lovely house. It was. Um, in, in the whole um, and it had this, it also had, it, it arose above, it was sort of high end vernacular in the sense that that neighborhood was built, most of that neighborhood was built at a similar time in the Victorian era mm -hmm. uh, and had similar gable uh, treatment mm -hmm. uh, with decorations and so forth and it fit nicely within that, mm -hmm. within that period. The homeowners, the applicants uh, didn't want to replicate the house um, and as, as I've said, as far as repeat myself, but would have had the right to completely uh, build whatever they wanted uh, within, uh, if they waited a year. Um, instead, they kindly decided to work with us and, um, and to expedite the process, and, and that's why we're given permission for the demo. Uh, at this point, it's, uh, uh, and we've given the, the permit, right? So. Um, it's been surrounded by chain link fence. Right. Um, yeah. The, the alternate plan, as you can see, um, I guess without making too many comments, uh, continues the, um, the applicant's uh, desire to have a colonial um, themed um, house of, of quite a large profile, but uh, the applicants have um, uh, put in a, have added a uh, cornice treatment that is uh, relevant to the existing cornice treatment. Um, they've switched the front door to the side street, but maintain a front door, function front door, in order to not um, have a cessation of gas service, which would have occurred if they had changed the front door to a different street. Um, well, it would make sense actually to make uh, the new, new, new gas a new front door means a new address, and a new address means uh, a cessation of on-street gas service. 
So uh, I, I think it was pretty smart. They maintained their front door, on, a, a technical front door on, 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 on Finn Street. Um, so um, this is a, this is in anybody's view a compromise. I think the the applicants compromised with us, made some changes that that were um, kind of provided by some of the members of the committee to help with proportions. Um, and they have continued the cornice treatment that, uh, the heat treatment, I should say, uh, that uh, uh, ties it in with some existing houses on the street, even though it's not quite typical of, uh, of a colonial structure. But. So they've added some further um, decorative things that really have a very strong federal design that add up the decorative trust no longer makes sense. It's a completely different time period. So I would just recommend if they got rid of that, then then it's a federal style of colonial. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I agree, Emily. I, it felt like they were sort of just decorating this um, and not really, just kind of pulling things out of a hat. I don't know. It also looks like they've got, like, it looks like dentals or something in the Gable, yeah, sure. Yeah, one yeah, 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 yeah. very ornate, and I just think it's completely inappropriate. Um, you know, this house, um, with that trusting, it really lends itself to more of a um, Victorian style that's much more vertical in nature, and this house is very horizontal. <laughs> um, both the front facade and the Wharf Street facade, so it just doesn't, it's competing with each other, and it just, the proportions are really, really messed up on this thing. So, I agree. Oh, that's a really good point. I agree. Yeah. I was looking at it, and I couldn't put it in those words, but I agree. It, that would, that, it's, it's a shame because that was part of what, that was we, were what we wanted to say. To say. Right. Yeah. You know, that historical yeah. feature. Um, I think there was considerable um, comment at the meeting last time in support of this. I certainly hear the, the comments now. My suggestion as an individual would be that we give the, the homeowners an option not to construct that, um, uh, that he work if they want to avoid it, if they, if they want to include it. We have already more or less guided them to it. If they don't want it, they don't have to. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, let, them, let them choose. Okay. So which element specifically? The facing fence so raised the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the timber, timbering under the... Above the um, and then the ornamental detail around the cable. The pattern is. I don't know what that is, but... Did you say the planning board has already approved this? They do not need to. Oh, they do. Mm -hmm. but, but they but they had a permit. I'll, they just need a building permit. Oh, okay. And building permits don't approve designs. They just yeah. I do want to note, just from an architectural standpoint and from a preservation standpoint, that there are any number of um, Georgian houses in Northampton, certainly in farm towns around here, that have. Um, been added onto in the Victorian era with porches, uh, additional hip roofs, um, uh, various uh, appurtenances that are distinctly Victorian, but that are um, uh, clearly underneath that a, uh, mm -hmm. a, a Georgian, uh, you know, 1760 house. So it's not at all impossible that if a house were there, in fact, this is catty corner from a, a true Georgian. Um, is on the corner of Finn and State. Um, uh, so it's conceivable that if a house were to have had originally been built there, that, it, that a, an owner could have added um, some gym cracks onto the to the to the uh, eave uh, at a later date. So it's not it's not a um, an, an architectural impossibility, but I think uh, what we, sounds like what we should convey to the applicant is that it's a matter of their personal choice we don't require it to be built. I think that's it. Any other questions on any other topics or suggestions on this overall proposal? Okay. Um, hearing none then um, let's would someone like to make a motion. Um. 
I make a motion to approve the design with the option, in giving the um, applicants the option of removing the um, ornamental detail and the in the streets pediment. I'll second it. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay, I'll call the vote. All those in the get show of hand, all those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. All those opposed? So it's uh, two, three, four, support, one opposed. So that passes, isn't it? Um, <coughs> the next item on our agenda is, is the discussion of local historic district ordinance uh, project categories, and that was uh, also distributed by email to everyone. And, Sarah, would you like to discuss that? So I, I put this on the agenda following discussion of the lighting at the check writers building. Um, so the, the city solicitors made clear that anything that's listed as exempt from public historic district review is exempt. That that's it. There are no no questions asked. Those those items are exempt. Um, some applicants may be willing to have discussions about those items with the commission, but they are they cannot be required to do so. Um, so this ordinance was drafted, when, when was this drafted? 20 years ago maybe? Um, um, I think it was 92. Yeah, so you know, um, I don't know the justification for including all of these items as, as exempt items. Some of them are included in that historic list of things which may be exempted, which most communities have elected just to put into the, their ordinance. In, um, and just include all of them. I think some of them were intended not to make things onerous for single family homeowners. That's right. And then others are really unlikely to affect the historic character of the district. But it's um, anytime there's a question about things, it's always a, a good opportunity to go back and look at the ordinance. Can I say something about that? Please. I was on the committee that drafted the downtown architecture ordinance, and that was prior to the historic commission. And we came up with a number that, that ordinance tried and failed twice, um, because this, a lot of citizens didn't want it. Mm -hmm. So the third time I was on the committee, and we specifically came up with a number of exemptions that we knew would make people much more receptive to this. Mm -hmm. And I could never, in good conscience, go back and say, hey, we want to get rid of this exemption just because it's been 20 years. Because I have to look back and say, yeah, this is how we got the ordinance passed. It's because we made these important exemptions and made everybody happy. So I think that that's important to remember when you come up with a commission and ordinance. What are the ones that would be in discussion that would be in play to, to restore. I'm not suggesting anything in particular. Um, I just knew it would come up, so I thought it, it was important to get on the agenda. Tom, let me ask you a question. I'm not, I didn't originate this, and I'm not sure how I feel on it. But let me, if I could, just follow up on your comment. I see your point explicitly. Um, I think you and I could both voice the alternate comment, which is many people are afraid of, of architectural restrictions um, when they first introduce. I mean, it's a classic history of, of historic districts where the people think that people are going to be knocking on the door and you know restricting them from uh, you know classic when paying the house. Um, and, and once they see the value of the historic district to industrial property values, see what it, that, that life goes on and, and that they're largely permitted to, you know, that they actually enjoy the protections that a district provides for their neighborhood. 
is a relaxing of, of fear. Um, given that no changes would be made to an historic district without hearing by elected representatives at you know, the council level, uh, so that the, no historic, nobody is going to, you know, unilaterally and, and in a star chamber somewhere uh, uh, impose more restrictions on people. Isn't there, an, isn't there room for uh, discussion of increasing restrictions now that people see that it's not such a bad thing? I mean, the history of historic districts nationwide is that generally, if you look at, at a lot of the most successful places like in, in Massachusetts and the Cape and Islands and Boston and so forth, um, they started off very gently and then moved to gradually, reasonably, but adding a few more things as time went by that are protected. Um, I, I see your point too, though. Well, my comment about that is it, it is onerous. Any kind of restriction is onerous. And the more finely detailed the restriction is, the more onerous and angry people get. I've been on the other side with clients who were so angry sitting and listening to any board talk. And I just always tell them, you know, you just got to stay within the rules. The rules are created for a good reason. But, you know, one of the big comments I heard for downtown architecture by the people who were opposed to any kind of regulation was, oh, okay, now they got the foot in the, foot in the door. Mm -hmm. Now they can continue to impose more restrictions. Okay. So. What, what, I mean, you're, you're, you're not, you don't just work on behalf of clients, you also are a proponent of smart growth and, and, and good, good practice. Right. Um, and um, there's no question, but if you look at it, if you look at highly restrictive districts, like let's say, Baker Town, um, there's no question but that the historic district restrictions have, have vastly increased the value of real estate in, in the town. Um, and if people had been allowed to build as they wanted, um, that, that would not happen. Um, and furthermore, I'm sure that as people work to live within those restrictions, or, or take downtown sale, where I was visited recently. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of vituperation and condemnation of the historic district's requirements by people who are at the same time enjoying, uh, you know, quadrupling of property values in, in, in some of the districts that are the result of the historic district. Where is the balance? How do we, how do we find the uh, is there, is there a way to, to achieve a balance? Well, I think that your balance has to rely on the economic abilities of the people who live here. That, that they do, in, in our community, people, I, I think, I don't know how to say this, but they need, a lot, they need to have some freedom. And, and, and I think that in a, in a place like Martha's Vineyard, where people are so wealthy. They, well, say they, Newburgh they, or Salem or, I mean, just leave, leave the Cape Island. I, I think that you have to drive them They're not much. <laughs> Newburyport is still it's Salem is, yeah. you know, they've got, the, I mean, the south side of Salem is a little, yeah. you know, in transition, but most of Salem is. <clears throat> well, I was just walking along, I, I just stayed in, in, in lovely area of downtown, of club that immediately adjacent to downtown Salem that was, uh, uh, I, I could never afford to live in. I, it's not derelict whatsoever. Um, and uh, so, uh, I'm, I mean, I, excuse me for putting names on, on communities, but we've all, we've all seen the advantages and we all believe in the advantages. I know you believe in the advantages. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I really like it when, um, when I do a project that there is I'm not the only one saying you need to make this look compatible with the neighborhood. That I there's some something that backs me up, which is a board like yours in downtown architecture. I, I really like that. But when you get into the really nitty gritty, fine detailed restrictions, it it really becomes onerous. 
And the other thing is they have to pay me a lot more to deal with all those little issues. So that's why I said you got to recognize the economic status of the community we live in because they are paying me to be here at these meetings and to make all these drawings and to give these presentations. But the more restrictions there are, the more work I got to do, and the more it costs them. And if they just want to renovate a little small, you know, Victorian house, it's, it becomes very onerous. So you're right; you have to reach a balance. There is a balance for the community you live in, and there are some great communities that have unbelievably beautiful buildings, which cost a lot of money to do that kind of thing. In my realm, building rail trains. That was a newfangled idea back in the 90s, much like doing historic districts, local, local historic districts. Not national register ones that have no meaning, but local historic districts do have a meaning and an impact. And I've resurrected every project that was voted down in the last 15 years. In Massachusetts, there was eight of them. Rail trail projects? Rail trail projects that were voted down as, as disparate communities as Weston to Belchertown, Williamsburg, Southampton, Danvers. They are all in favor because the generational shift has taken place when they're not seen as a newfangled idea anymore. I'll also add in that I'll lead bike tours of local historic districts in Holyoke, for example. These, these don't get created because people sit together over tea and say, oh, what a fun thing, let's do this. There's some cataclysmic thing that happens in every local historic district, no matter where it is, that caused a call to action. Yeah, I, I, and that I, call to action I, I, still sits there, and people don't understand. If you corner Franklin and Elm Street here. How this, this, the side, the right side of that house was boxed in with Z brick with a, with a square vinyl window. That was the call to action. Yeah, I wrote a letter to the editor. It was published. Yeah, so I was you were here before me. <laughs> I just make trouble going into places. But, I understand that, you, but we're still but trying to can, come up with a balance for what's Your right. memory of those hearings 20 years ago, 25 years ago, if the, if, the, if the improvements are to the, to the regulations are well thought out and, and well sold in terms of public participation, I think, I think it can be successful there. Right? Times change. Most of the 20th century people are retired or moved on. 21st century people appreciate these projects. Right. Luby's Jet Boy is still there. <laughs> yes, but right in the uh, middle of it all. <laughs> yes, but she was one of the stretching big, pennies in the She was water. on the historic district commission when I went on it. Probably um, Pauline too, because we went on at the same time. We not Luby's. Oh, yes, she was on it. She was. Yeah, yes, she was. Lady. She was one of the, yes, the like, right. guardians of the yeah. private. Yeah, the public. You know, the private property yeah. owners, and she was always getting us to, you know, kind of think again and hold back. And mm -hmm. it was it, it was useful having someone like that on it. Um, so, but yeah, I understand. I just want to make one clarification, Craig. I think that National Register districts do have a lot of meaning. You you said they don't have any meaning, and they really do. In fact, we are about to um, establish another one in Florence. Um, I know, on the south side of Main Street. I'm, I'm very supportive of that. Okay. So it's actually bigger than that. But um, I think that they open up opportunities for fundraising, for mm -hmm. getting grants. There are a lot of reasons to do them, so they're not meaningless. And they also weave together a story. So I just like, want to go correct, correct you on that. <coughs> Um, I would like to ask the commission to uh, go back and reread the, the mailing on this. I think that we need to continue this discussion. Um, Sarah, do we need to reach a, a, a discussion on this tonight? Okay, I don't have a more important um, um, discussion or at least continuation of this discussion. Um, 
if everybody can can come prepared next time uh, we meet yeah. in less than a month. Right. And um, I'd like to continue it. And please, uh, everybody be there homework on this. And call Sarah if you have any questions. Okay. We're in table for the moment. The next business on our agenda is a review of um, potential Connecticut River underwater rock cribbing removal. I know that's been a matter of great uh, discussion and attention within this commission um, and opinions run every which direction. Um, and if some of you are pro rock cribbing, underwater rock cribbing, and others of you are vehemently opposed. Um, but um, Sarah, would you like to? But this has been clarified. I think for. Uh, Board meetings. I sent out um, a letter from Wayne some time ago. Yeah, the damages. Yeah, with, yeah, yeah, with a request to remove this this underwater rock cribbing that is a hazard to boats. Um, no one can see it, so it's it, it's underwater and it's there, and it and it was related to an above water historic feature, um, but it's um, it's not doing anything anymore. It's like costing us money because when, we we have to rock, mark it as a hazard to boats. When was the rock cribbing built? Uh, the rock curving was part of the it's logging, right? Yeah, yeah, it was I part of the the logging. Logging when, was that had to be logging yeah. for 1800s at some point. I don't know exactly. Yeah. Sure, so we, we looked at it, but didn't we? and then voted that there was no problem. And and we looked at it, but never came to a vote. Yeah. Oh, okay. So does the city market with voting something here? Is that what they do? Okay. I know I've heard suggestions about underwater interpretive signage. Um, yeah. <laughs> but. Sorry. We could sign it to um. I mean, the only thing that comes to mind is, you know, whether um, Historic Northampton would be interested in, I don't know if they have any information, you know, they've done any research on this, but it might be an interesting, you know, exhibit or program or something. Mm -hmm. Sign protect. The kind of thing Lori would really like. Bridge yeah. Oh, oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's that's. Sure. Sure. Is this sign protect bridge abutments? Uh, they're not bridge abutments. These are. You no, know, but it was it designed to protect them. No. So this was part of the logging that occurred down the Connecticut River. So that people would cut logs up in Montague and uh, send them I, in the river. And what, did, what did they? What did the cribbing do? I. It was. I don't actually. Okay. I think I believe it was part of some on top of river structure that would trap the logs yeah. so that they could so be. The city, the city, okay, so the city okay. itself would like to remove this. Yes. Okay. Yes. So it, that it doesn't have to be marked anymore by by a blue. Where is it? Where along the river? There's a couple spots, right? It's kind of near um, um, where the dog. Isn't it near where the dog park is going? The dog. Is, we know this from community is preservation. Is it near Elwell Island? Is it? Um, you know, trying to. Well, it, it, it's an interesting question, but for the sake of today's okay. meeting, um, yeah. is there a, is there um, anyone who is has questions or is opposed to the removal of um, previously unseen underwater <laughs> log and cribbing? No. Under the Connecticut, that we are told. We're uh, they're not. They're not entirely underwater. There are photos in, in Wayne's um, okay. memo that he sent out. This was during very low water conditions, so you couldn't you couldn't see it. Now. You wouldn't be able to see it. Now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. now it's just it's sort of it looks like it's just some logs with wood wrap. But it just juts out into the river, it looks like. It's built up from the river. It's built up. So Wayne said, um, each log driving season for when the cribs were installed until 1915, there was a log and cable barrier between the two cribs to catch logs during log drives. Mm -hmm. Logs were stored and then, as needed, pulled by steam powered tugboat to a sawmill in the former Oxbow down the street, mm -hmm. or else they were released to feed Holyoke sawmill. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's from the. Mm -hmm. A yeah. neat documentary. Have anybody seen it? Of um, dynamite, whiskey, and wood of log drives in the Connecticut mm -hmm. River. It's pretty cool. I think you can get it from Channel 57. Oh, wow. okay. So there has been some whiskey, whiskey and wood. Yeah. 
Pauline, did you want to make a motion regarding the underwater rock? Oh, rock um, cribbing? make a motion that the underwater a rock cribbing uh, be removed as uh, proposed by the city. I'll second that. Any discussion? I would just like to say that, I mean, there are some pictures of it, but I'd like to make sure that it's documented. either Stuart Northampton can take charge of those or mm -hmm. Forbes Library or something to, so mm -hmm. that pictures of it do exist. Mm -hmm. uh, this Could won't be happening anytime soon. This yeah. will have to go before the, the State yeah. Board of Underwater Archaeological right. Resources, right. which we didn't know about until we started. Right. Right. So underwater yes. pictures or weight below yes. water or something. Yeah. I think yeah. it would be um, interesting to throw away whisks in wood, I think she said. That's interesting. Do we need a site visit? <laughs> I wouldn't suggest going this week. Like right now. Yeah. Um, okay. So the motion, there's a motion has been made and seconded that uh, we, um, I, I guess, express no objection to um, uh, the removal of the um, Connecticut River underwater rock cribbing uh, at proposed by the city. Uh, and we've had discussion. Is there any more discussion? Okay, I'll call the motion. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Um, and I want to ask about the committee's um, pleasure. It's now seven, just after seven. Uh, we have several new, several old business items to. Uh, on our agenda, uh, being old business, we don't necessarily have to take a moment. Uh, just one, let's I, I let's like take some guidance on. Um, so we have received um, the grant from MHC and the CPA to do work on the Bridge Street and other historic cemeteries. Work has started, um, so I'd, I'd like your opinion on moving forward with a potential program with historic Northampton. Can you talk about that? Um, yeah, I think, um, I know when it was reviewed by the Community Preservation um, Committee, we were very much in favor of trying to um, get as much publicity about it as possible. And um, so I think that it's something that we should definitely work with North Historic Northampton on. Will they be taking, the, would they take the lead on that? I don't know. I haven't reached out to Lori yet. I wanted to okay. get the, the commission's I don't know, as a board member, I'd say that at the moment we're really consumed with redoing our back space and putting in a new mm -hmm. exhibition which is supposed to open. It's either really late May or early June. So okay. they might be, but, but there have been ongoing programs elsewhere, a lot of them in the Arts Trust building in the meantime. So I would definitely, you know, we could approach them, but I just, and then presumably this work's going to be going on for a while. Yeah. So if it had to be delayed a little bit, it would probably still work, but I think it would be something that we would be interested in. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the Bridge in. Street Absolutely. work is getting done more quickly Very because it's yeah. the grant yeah. funding from MHC requires that. Right, right. Um, but the conservators will be working on and off all yeah. summer. And they'll yeah, be moving on to Bridge Street, I'm or sure to Park Street. Be interested. Yeah. Because yeah. we are having a series of programs over the summer that, because the new exhibition on the history of Northampton focuses on Main Street, tells sort of tells the history of the city mm -hmm. through looking at Main Street. And um, so there are going to be some programs for that, but I, I can't imagine that we wouldn't want to figure out some way to also, you know, it's right next door to us, so. Right, yeah. Get, yeah. yeah. And then I guess kind of dovetailing with that, um, and I'll just bring this up, the, you know, the CPC voted to award funding for the National Register District in the Abolitionist and Reform area of Florence. And so that's going to be coming underway really soon. Um, and part of what the CBC wanted with that funding was to try to get, again, a lot of publicity about that project. They were very moved by the presentations that were given um, at the review meeting. And um, just really wanted to see the information get spread. So um, we you know, need to work with Steve Strymer, who's heading that up. The, the funding was awarded to the Robo Center, so they're going to be managing the project, but we need to be involved with them. So, 
Steve's coming to our meeting in May. He is. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Which will be because of Memorial Day three weeks from today, so yeah. May 20th. Direction on the cemetery thing, Sarah. Yeah, I guess I'll I'll do what we need to support because um, we're actually we're having we're having a board meeting. I think it's May whatever next Thursday is May second or May fourth May second May second. So I might bring it up. That okay, going to be contacting her or just okay, and and then just let you know we don't need to do a program if if you're feeling overwhelmed and there's yeah, so much yeah. going on in Hampton, yeah. yeah. but. If there's going to be well, walks, walks and talks, she can get involved yeah. with you or something. Sure. About it. She okay. talked about doing a, a like something with the lichens. Did she know about that? Well, that's right. Yeah. Right. Right. And I suggested she work on it while the conservators are there because right. part of what they do before they take over the house. Right. Right. Okay. Right. Right. Different slant on the. Yeah. Destroying habitat. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, I'll bring it up at her. Yeah, definitely. And Craig, did you have anything on the house tour? Yes, the house tour is solidifying. We now have six houses, and that's our quota. There will be six houses on the tour of June 29th. Okay. Um, it's a Saturday from noon to four, uh, partnering with the Historic Commission and the uh, Cooley Dickinson Hospital internal fundraising committee. They came forward with this. The outreach Kathy and I we will be on the tour. We'll be one of the six houses. Um, we're going to develop a very nice ticketing system. I'll design the brochures. I was hoping to get a letter from the president chair of the historic commission, maybe even Sarah to talk I, about what historic commissions do. I, that is unlike to do it. Yeah, because this is a great opportunity for us to highlight all the things that we do in a way that the general public can participate in and see the insides of these houses. It was kind of a heavy lift to get people to open up their houses. You know, we with a better <laughs> practice, we live at the edge of open house. I understand that most people don't, and uh, so we do have six, including uh, 123 Meadow Street, which will be in the National Register okay. District down there. Good. If and I could just uh, mention that the houses, because Craig and I consulted with um, Lynn Parsons from Cooley Dickinson, yes. yeah. and they're, all of these houses are ones that in the past we've One given, awards. we have given awards That's to. Yes. But they're really running it, right? Pardon? <laughs> The Cooley Dickinson is really right. doing it. I'm in the background yeah. doing all the yeah. technical right, right. stuff. Doing a lot of that stuff. And so. um, I pulled all the Form Bs. Yeah. One property doesn't have a Form B on it. Do you think we can create a Form B for one property? What is that? Which one is that? 78 North Elm Street, <coughs> Councilor Murphy's house won an historic preservation award, yeah. but there was never a Form B on that yeah. house. So it's something that you signed to go down. I think anybody can do it and submit it. Yep. They're open now. Have they moved and reopened? The, oh, the registry? Yeah. Uh, they're, they're still in the old location for the time being. I don't know how long they'll be okay. there. But that's an update there. Uh, she just met with uh, the owners of 123 Meadow Street this morning. They green lighted it. And uh, so now we have the six. We'll develop a Google map showing the optimal route between all the houses. Okay. Be 12 to 4. There'll be staffers, volunteers from the hospital, volunteer squadrons there to, mm -hmm. to come and help is at the, the houses. Is the intent of the tour decorative or historical? I would say historical to, to call out that there are historic houses in our midst that people have gotten awards for and people are living normal everyday 21st century lives in historic houses. Mm -hmm. and, and so it'll be fun, it's four hours, two open houses. It's great. 
Um, Steve's primary been in touch with us about one or two, uh, make a presentation about the um, Florence uh, National Historic District. Um, and uh, we encourage him to come, and that will be on May 20th. Tonight, May. Yes. Yeah, he said that he was going to do, he would like to come. Yeah. Yeah. 20th, yes. Yeah. Um, so we certainly look forward to hearing from him on that and encourage his great work. Um, is there anything else uh, regarding State Hospital that we should we, talk we about? Not, okay. We have not met. Recently. All right. Um, and we, um, we have not talked about the historic district so or uh, design standards. Uh, we put that up a couple of times, but mm -hmm. I surely want to get to that uh, next meeting. Is there any other business not seen uh, when the agenda was developed? announcement it's very difficult to make um, as you know I'm filling in for a position on the board and I was asked to renew that position um, after careful consideration I'm gonna have to decline um, I took this position probably not really fully understanding the conflicts of interest and having read that at great length and actually talking to Sarah and some other experts. Um, I run a very small practice and I can't exclude myself from potential clients. So I hope you understand uh, my position. It's a very difficult position because I really respect yeah. the things you do. Um, you understand the term. Uh, so, and I apologize for any inconvenience with not understanding those things before I agree. Yeah. So. Well, that's completely understandable, but we're really sorry. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a hard decision. Um, all right. Well, you'll approach future future work in Northampton with a sensitivity <laughs> now after oh, having yeah, absolutely. the commission. Um, very good. Well, we, we uh, certainly will miss your attendance and, and we like we're hardly doing it now, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, thank you for helping. Uh, well, you put that thing. If you're aware of any other architects who may be interested and potentially wouldn't have those same types of conflicts because of the work that they do, please encourage them to submit an application. I will I'll think about it. Or ask people. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, any other new business? Okay. Um, not on the agenda, but okay. Um, there being none, then uh, I hear a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second.